So, hello folks. Um, hi, I'm Tom Achitz from AT&T. It looks like it's about time to get things started. Uh, Kang Wan told me that he might not be here at the beginning and I need to kind of get started if he's not. Um, welcome to the after lunch nap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope that at least it will be a little bit entertaining and, um, and somewhat informative. And I know we'll all be struggling together to get past that big chocolate, double chocolate brownie that most of us had. Um, I've got two talks back to back, so you're doubly in for it. Um, and the first talk is kind of, I'm, so first of all, I'm an architect at AT&T. And of course, architect's one of those highfalutin titles that means half the time I'm dreaming and the other half of the time I have to figure out how to do things that really make a difference in the world. So you get one talk from each side of my, of my split personality. In the first talk, we'll be talking about uh, applying cloud principles to software drivers. This is kind of forward looking. It's something that I don't think exists yet, but I think it would be very interesting for people to think about and it's sort of like something that might be a really interesting place for us to all go together. And then the second talk will be sort of a rundown on all the different specs that AT&T has brought to OCP, what they're good for and, and how we think that we want to use them and, and would you care to join us and provide some inputs and, and work together on those specs. So with that, and I couldn't find the clicker, so I'm going to be jumping around. Um, on the first talk, we're going to go through this kind of an agenda. I'm going to look at how uh, network elements are built today. I'm going to not take a lot of time with that. Then we're going to look at sort of this notion of a distributed driver architecture, where a driver is kind of silicon libraries, or the things that are very low level in network elements, and look at some of the new system architectures and how we can, how we can apply that to the driver space. So why don't we start with something we know really well. So uh, most of us have, the, we, we call it a PNF, uh, right? A physical network function. It's what we know and love and have racked and stacked into telcos for years and years. And it's a bundle of hardware software, usually it includes an element management system and <laughs> critically one throat to choke, right? The support from a, a beloved supplier. And it's, um, it's all bundled like that. It's also pretty highly resistant to disaggregation or for component reuse. Now, these things are put together by a supplier who's thinking about, I've got to meet the needs of lots of different carriers, and they're all disparate, and I've got to kind of even that out across the entire market and come up with something that will be good enough for most carriers. <clears throat> the firmware features are updated based on the times that the supplier can get them done. And, and when they believe it's a good idea to do so. And a lot of times, um, redundancy is done you know, through one-to-one -one duplication. You might have two processor cards that go into a box like this, and they sort of sync up with each other. If one of them fails, the second one takes over. Now, we, the operators who make use of these things, usually have to go through a little bit of development, right? So we create tool chains that nestle the EMS into our, into our operations stack, and our operations folks create all kinds of tools that sort of map what's available from the element into what they need to operate the network. And so there's, there's a fair amount of development that goes on there, and it's often, you know, it's often significant, not, not insignificant. Um, and many times, what happens is if you wanted to collect performance and service information, you won't just use the network element, you'll also probably create a number of um, taps and, and, and probes and performance routers and, and these things that sort of surround it and watch the service that's going through the box so you can manage the box and understand how well it's operating in the network. All right, and then there's another reason that these things tend to be kind of big, and that is when the internet routing table does its next thing, and you know we're looking for two or three billion routes to put into a box like this, I at least have to swap out CPUs. And when you get to that size, many times you're talking about to make that all work, and you, you're thinking about a chassis-based system. Putting it into a one rack U device doesn't make a lot of sense. So. And in the um, OCP, there's a sort of a stack that's, um, that's, uh, that's commonly talked about. In fact, I shamelessly stole it from a Microsoft presentation. Um, and so this is sort of what people think about in OCP. And most of these functions run 
on, on the network element, on a, on a switch, right? Or on a, on a single box. And the, the thing here is that um, the software is sharing state with that box. So the box goes away, the software goes away, the software goes away, the box goes away. And um, often the box CPU is selected for one application, maybe a data center, and then when a telco wants to put the internet route table on it, it just falls apart, or it's completely you know, not usable in that application. So the having you know, selected that one size CPU to put in like a one rack unit device is often something that wind up having some regrets later on. And then uh, for complex control planes, you might find out that you know, the kind of CPU and, and, and memory that you put in the box is insufficient for complex problems. So, but as you can tell from the title, uh, if we think out of the box, what could we do if we started thinking about many of these small devices working together in tandem in, in a kind of a cloud-based architecture. And so here I, tell, I pull a pattern. I've shamelessly stolen another picture, uh, this one from a, a popular SDN controller. And what they do in SDN controllers is they distribute the load. You know, they shard the information. So if they lose a given server, they don't lose all of the state. They don't lose all of the data. And this is, you know, that was taken again from the IT folks before that when they created these large scale out databases. So they can have uh, processes that have a total memory that exceeds any one server. They can have databases that are very large and very robust because they're distributed and the state is not locked up in just one device. So, wow, that's kind of cool because now we're taking small pieces and we're creating something that's, that's ver more available than any one of the small pieces and uh, can do tasks that are bigger than any of the small pieces. And you can probably see where I'm going with this argument, right? Um, so what if we looked at applying that kind of pattern from SDN? And the SDN pattern is pretty good, right? But right now, what happens is I've got a lot of, um, I've got a network operating system, one of these SDN controllers, and it usually uses something like OpenFlow or some other similar protocol to direct simple packet forwarding hardware. And that hardware still has an agent that has to translate from what OpenFlow says into what the merchant silicon is doing in that box, right? It's not without software. And so, uh, and then I've run into some other problems that, you know, OpenFlow covers a great, a great many interesting problems, but it doesn't cover every end cap, and it doesn't solve every kind of networking problem. It's really good about forwarding in that match action rule paradigm. If you leave the match action rule paradigm, then it, it kind of, you know, it gets thin. But what if we looked at something at a lower layer? What if we didn't think about the open flow abstraction, but pushed it down? And I know you've probably heard about things like the P4 language, which is available in some of this new silicon. It allows you to more or less program the forwarding plane inside the silicon. And you could think about the SAI interface that OCP has talked about, but what if it were networked? It were a microservice instead of just an API or something else. And so the thing here is I don't have an answer for what's the best candidate there, but it's, it's something that I think we could think about and work toward. So what does the silicon really require? And what I would claim is that if you look through most of modern, modern um, switching and, and access silicon, these are not simple pieces of, they're not just simple ASICs. They actually have processors and firmware that run inside the chip, right? They're, they have CPUs and, and whatnot. And um, they are usually managed through a communications path and, and the management is already kind of packet oriented whether it's going over PCI Express or whether it's going through an in-band Ethernet connection, there's already this, what I would call, inter-process communication going on between the firmware that's running inside the silicon and the, and the software or the other kind of firmware that's running on the CPU in a white box. And that's really interesting because if you got inter-process communication, you could pull that apart a bit farther than we do today. And so, what if, we borrow this model from SDN controllers, but instead of trying to create um, like an open flow interface at the bottom end, we look at adapting or making use of those kinds of inter-process communications that manage the silicon more directly. 
now you have access to everything that silicon can do. And um, well, obviously, you don't have the unification that OpenFlow would give you in, in that type of a model. But you do have um, all of the tools from the distributed framework at the high level. So you can have the consistency model that you're looking for. You can have the availability from running the driver in more than one instance of a CPU across maybe, I'll get that in the next chart, but across multiple boxes, right? And then, um, and then you can drive the silicon with something that's more native to what it does and pull the features out that, that it provides more completely. <clears throat> so, and of course, this model doesn't have to be the end all. You could build right on top of it, or this available, available layer could provide the same sort of thing that your OpenFlow agent does today and feed something that's a more centralized and provides a larger scope of control uh, for network control planes. So the idea being that all of this architecture here could pull together a number of different um, small boxes and make them look like one of these did in the before time. And functional distribution could be uh, fairly interesting because um, I got two, two models here. On the left side, we've pulled the CPU out of the white box. So imagine um, if you've seen the, the spec for AT&T's Open GPON OLT, there's no need for the processor. We can actually manipulate and manage the silicon through an in-band control channel from an adjacent server. And what that says here is I can use those adjacent servers to manage one or more boxes in conjunction and create a very high, highly available management layer for a number of devices. But I don't have to be pushed into that model. If you think about most of the white boxes we see have a CPU on them, and with today's you know, processors, you can get many, many cores in a very low wattage unit that would easily go into a white box. And so these things don't have to be so big. They could actually be the number of processors that are already coming inside of these switches and, and small access de devices. And so imagine them not being isolated from one another, but speaking to each other in order to share the state and to share the control of a, of a distributed process across many boxes. And that's basically you know, sort of the idea and where we're going. Um, we have also a getting started model. And so it really is getting started. In the, in the typical agile way, we get started with something very simple, starts going in the proper direction, but it doesn't really solve all the problems that we're after yet. So we have this uh, project within, um, within Owen Lab that's called Volta, which is uh, building the same kinds of concepts that you've got a model-driven distributed core capability, and then you plug in silicon APIs directly instead of protocol drivers like OpenFlow at the bottom end. At the top, using uh, technologies like the protocol buffers from Google, we intend to be able to generate northbound APIs more or less on the fly from the model that's baked into the driver. Now, the things that are missing are lots of, lots of working plugins, obviously. That's a lot of work to do. And the distribution. So right now, this is still running in just one, one slice or one, one box. All right. So in summary, today, networks are really kind of self-contained. The white boxes are their own little failure domains. It's nice because they're small, and there's lots of them. But I think we can do better in that um, by using the same kind of concepts that were built into SDN controllers, we can think about using you know, what I would call uh, microservices or, or sharded capabilities to make um, more available drivers for these kinds of boxes or to make the boxes work better when there are many of them working in conjunction. All right, so I'll, I'll pause now before we go into the second talk and take questions. <laughs> Alan? Okay, so the question is, wouldn't it be less reliable than having a CPU in every box um, because you have external communications? And um, I, don't th I don't think so, right? So having an um, internal CPU means that you have a single point of failure with that CPU. If I... 
That's right, and that's too. Uh, also, but the idea here is if the CPU or even the software running in the CPU, which is probably the more likely failure vector, uh, goes out, the crater is the box, right? If I have, like, if you have a look at the, the spec that we put forward for the GPON OLT, the communications to each piece of silicon goes out the two paths to different top of rack switches and can go to different compute platforms. So we can actually fail over drivers if, if the CPU that's managing silicon dies or the path goes out, you can go the other path to another CPU that takes over its, yeah. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. Okay. Other questions, comments? Tomatoes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yep. So uh, David from Adtran points out a very good point that um, one of the other extra bonus benefits of creating microservices across lots of processors and memory in these boxes is that if you have other processes that consume a lot of resource, they become possible where they weren't before. And so the innuendo I did early on about the internet route table and, and large complex protocols that you rarely see in a one rack unit device, they could, become an, they could become enabled when you have several of them working in tandem. Good, very good point, thank you. Um, so the, the question, help me if I got it right, is is there not a problem here trying to get silicon vendors to line up with similar in-band management? And so what I've observed so far is that many of them have some form of in-band management. And of course, as you point out, they're not all the same. So it's a lot of work right now to create sort of an abstraction layer and kind of map to all the different, you, you have the driver problem all over again. I don't know how we could get the silicon manufacturers to sort of cough up a, a, single, a single protocol for that type of thing. It'd be great if we could, but um, I haven't figured that one out either. <laughs> right, <laughs> David? Oh, there's always a solution. <laughs> it's the political will. <laughs> okay. All right, good point. Um, yes? Let's say that you put the local home CPU in each silicon, like a Xeon D as an example. Yeah. And if the bytes are interconnected together, you've got the clusters of Xeon D, it's almost physically there's one in the box. You still have the notion of logical controller, but you've got that mix of uh, the uh, benefits of having a local host in terms of data. Yes, so I think, um, I'm sorry, let me sort of repeat it. I don't know if everyone heard you, uh, and I'm sure I was listening well too. <laughs> um, the idea is that having a local CPU is great, and the latency between local silicon and a lo local CPU is very low, and you can still federate a number of those for failure redundancy purposes. Wouldn't that be a good idea? I think that would be a good idea. In fact, that was what I was trying to imply in this picture where in the box itself you may have the CPU in memory and you, you create a, com a communication link across boxes to, to achieve that function. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. If you divide the system into small pieces, does it increase the interconnection cost? Um, I think you wind up almost having a wash in that if you divide it in small pieces, you're gonna incur cost here to interconnect with your uplinks, right, or inter interconnects. But if you create a large chassis-based device, you just hide them, they didn't go away. They're gonna be interior on like fabric interconnects and so forth. Is it? Uh, 
Ah, so now the second part is, but if I leave it inside, it's just a trace, and if it's out here, it's an optical module. And I, my argument is that for local interconnects, I would probably not, would not recommend using optical, but direct attach copper, right? The old bisync technology. And that, that's pretty cheap. Okay, Oded? Do you see any proof or see a way that you think that the distribution across longer distances is all one way for one Okay, so um, we had some, the question was how big could you distribute this? And I believe in a given physical location, it's not a problem. Right. And then, then it gets interesting when you say, okay, can I distribute this in a metro or in a region or in a nation? And I think at some point, it kind of all falls apart, right? So we've had a little bit of experience with, not with the, this kind of architecture directly, but with the SDN controllers that are sitting above it that, that have that same kind of sharded uh, database technology. And they work well for hundreds of kilometers, for sure. Okay. Yep, David. Uh, so, okay, so the question is, I made some statements about open flow, and, um, and, and could I clarify, <laughs> clarify what I was talking about? So I think open flow is really good for a, a, actually a large set of problems, and as a protocol, as far as the protocol goes, it's, it's robust and highly capable. What I found, though, in the last year or two is that the drivers that support it on any given piece of silicon in every, any given white box are a little not quite, you know, they're dicey. So I might often have to go and ask for revisions or fixes or they supported double tagging, but it wasn't AD, it was Q and Q. And it goes on and on like that, right? And what is, what is much more available and where I think we can create something more robust is if you work more directly with APIs that are native for the silicon um, those are the ones that get used in every application. It's not an API that's just used to support OpenFlow. It's an API used to support every application of that silicon across a broad set of things. It opens up more capabilities that are typically not always exposed for you know, the, the, the OpenFlow APIs and allows us to get at more advanced features. So it's kind of a time to market thing. I think if we had the time to develop extensions in a standard protocol, it's a lot like the question over here. Um, I forgot the gentleman's name, but it was Tim. So Tim was saying if we had a common protocol out of the silicon that was unified, that would be a really good thing to do. And if, if, that, if that happened, you wouldn't need OpenFlow. That would be, that would be like Nirvana, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. So the, the assertion was, would it be better to invest more into maturing OpenFlow than into building something else? And um, my assertion would be that in this Volta driver, this piece of software is, is actually addressing both of those problems. That regardless of whether you use OpenFlow or not, I have this problem of, of developing drivers for multiple silicon types and I need to abstract them in a common way and map them to something northbound that I can use over and over again. And in case you didn't see it up there, right? This is, this is sort of trying to solve the fact that many drivers for OpenFlow are not especially mature. And so what would you like to do? You try to create as much of the driver that can be reused from one bit of silicon to the next, and you try to make it um, 
sort of automatically generate the interfaces. And if, you're, if you like OpenFlow, if you like RESTConf, if you like NetConf, I don't care anymore, right? I've got all of those things enabled. So it's re really like in that direction. <clears throat> 